Good morning. Thank you for joining us for the Photography Tips and Virtual Staging Webinar with Jay Stringham and Julie Carpenter. This webinar is part of the Maryland Realtors Webinar Thursday series and one of the free Maryland Realtor benefits. The webinar topics are a wide variety to help you work smarter, not harder, presented to you by speakers from across the country and in your own backyard. This webinar is being recorded and will be available on the Maryland Realtors website. In this presentation, Jay Stringham will be going through the virtual staging process from start to finish. Jay will be joined by guest speaker Julie Carpenter. Julie has staged several hundred photos over the past several years. She will be so showing some insider tips and tricks. Please hold all questions till the end. Jay? Good morning. Thank you very much for having us. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here. All right, I'm going to pull my screen up here. And there we go. All right, so I'm going to talk a little bit about uh, photography and uh, offer some uh, photography tips and suggestions for real estate agents. And uh, part of that is going to be how you can best photograph a home uh, for using the virtual stager. It's not too difficult, but there are some uh, ways that you can shoot to make using that stager easier. And uh, we'll discuss that here. So if you have a minute uh, or sometime here in the next day, please visit realtourvision.com and take a look at our uh, do-it-yourself virtual staging and virtual tour software. And also you'll learn uh, if you are a busy agent, we certainly understand that. And uh, there are also solutions that we have uh, full service as well. Uh, Julie offers full service staging and we can help you find photographers in your area if you need. All right, excuse me, there we go. All right, so getting to the photography tips. Uh, photography tip number one, and, and you might laugh at me at this, but I'd just like to say, first off, considering hire, consider hiring a professional photographer. Um, it seems like that's probably a no-brainer, but we know a lot of folks like to take their own photographs and that's okay. But here are some reasons why you might want to consider hiring a professional photographer. Number one, your time is valuable. Could you be getting more leads or maybe closing more deals if you let a pro handle uh, your photography? That's uh, something to consider. Um, it's you know, there's, there's an old saying where people either have time or they have money, and uh, this is one of those situations where by saving yourself some time, you might be able to create more business and bring in, in, in some more income for yourself. It takes significant time to do real estate photography well. I would say on average, uh, shooting a home by the average professional takes about an hour sometimes a little less, you have some pros that go very quickly, some that take longer than that. But then you're not done once the images are done. You really should be taking those into post-processing and getting the most out of them uh, using Photoshop or Aurora or any number of uh, different uh, editing softwares out there. Um, so it, do, it does take quite a bit of time. Um, it, it sounds really impressive when you tell your pot uh, potential listing uh, people, your, your folks that are going to list a home with you, that you only use professional photography. I had personal experience with this uh, not too long ago. In the past couple of years, we were selling my grandmother's house, and uh, the agent said to us, we only use professional photography. Now, that really, really impressed my folks. They were very happy to hear that. It does sound very impressive. For me, I'm thinking, boy, you just saved me work. I don't have to worry about sh shooting a house myself. And uh, so it, it really does go very well in a listing presentation when you say, I only use professional photography. You'll also get high quality imagery in a short period of time. And, and by short period of time, most real estate photographers have a very quick turnaround time. Uh, typically speaking, uh, you know, usually 24 hours or so. And that is tough for getting professional quality images because of the time it does take to edit them and stuff. But you'll get that turnaround uh, very quickly. Now, the one thing I would say, you always want to, if you're considering using a professional, always take a look at their portfolio. Always ask them to show you examples of their work. There's a lot of folks out there that buy a digital camera and they try to jump into the industry and such, and, and there's just a lot to learn. It takes time to learn all that. So you want to look at their images and see if what they're producing is up to par. A couple of things you want to look for are the images and photos. Focus. That's the big one. You want to be able to see everything. You want everything in the image to be an acceptable focus from the very far wall to the things that are near to you. And there are techniques that uh, are required to do that. Uh, whatever camera they have, it, it, the camera does not matter. So if they're trying to impress you by saying, I have a, a Canon 5D Mark IV, show me the results because a good photographer can get good results with a less expensive camera 
just as easy as with a professional camera. There are certain features that make it uh, easier with a pro camera, but they can get professional quality results regardless of the camera. You want to look at the windows in a room. That's one of the first things I look at when I'm evaluating a photographer. Am I able to see detail out the window? Uh, or is the room lit up, but the uh, windows are blown out? Uh, that would tell you that they're either not sure how to balance the lighting between interior and exterior, or um, they just aren't going to take the time. So that, that's another thing. If you see them using vertical imagery, if they're shooting in portrait mode, that is kind of a warning that they don't have the gear that needed to do this right. Um, small spaces often are very difficult to shoot and you need an extremely wide angle lens to do that. And uh, seeing vertical images is an indication that that might be an issue. That being said, there are times where vertical images are appropriate. So don't just write them off if they have some vertical images. If say 25% or more are vertical, that's where I would start uh, being concerned. Also, another reason why you might want to consider hiring a pro is the gear and the software, it's relatively expensive to, to get enough gear. It's not just a matter of picking up a, a camera down at Best Buy and running out there. Uh, you need certain gear to do that. And we'll talk a little bit about that gear here. Okay, so you really want to do your own photography. So what can you do to get the best results? Coming back to that last point, I would say use the right gear. It really does take a very wide angle lens to shoot homes and do it appropriately. Uh, for an average DSLR, which is the type of camera where you can change out the lenses, um, 10 to 20 millimeter uh, or say like a 12 to 16 um, is, is really necessary in order to capture those spaces, especially when they're small spaces. You're going to want to use a tripod. You will always need to use a tripod when doing real estate photography. There's a huge difference between the amount of light that's in a room and the amount of light that's outside. And in order to balance those, you're going to need longer exposure times. And uh, using a tripod is necessary. Now, because you're using a tripod, that's going to mean you're going to need a remote shutter release. And this is just a device that uh, is off the camera that you can click and let the tell the camera to take the photograph. Some cameras will connect to cell phones and uh, you can use Wi-Fi to do that. That works fantastic. There are others you plug right into the camera. Um, so there's some options there. Self timer works too. Most cameras nowadays have the option of say a two or three second self timer and a 10 second self timer. That short self timer is perfect for something like this. Another reason why you, you want to use a remote shutter release or a self timer is if you have long exposure times and you press the button with your hand and remove it while the shutter's open, you get some camera shake and that will cause you to have some blurring. Do not use the on camera flash. If your camera has a flash on it, you do not want to use that. It's not going to be ample and about the worst place that anyone could put a flash is right above the lens. In almost every situation, that is not going to produce a very professional results. If you really want to get into things, you can just use to learn a flash off camera. Using a flash in the right way and blending images is really the best way to get the highest quality images possible, but that takes time and it takes some practice. Then of course you're going to need photo editing software. Adobe Photoshop is kind of the cream of the crop. Um, that's, that's most of what the professionals use, but there are a lot of lesser expensive versions out there. Um, Paint Shop Pro, they have, I think it's X10 now. That is a really nice software. The only issue I have with it is there's not as much training out on the uh, internet as there is for Photoshop. Um, Adobe uh, uh, Lightroom is fantastic. We use that all the time. Some things you can't do in that. Uh, that's why you would need Photoshop as well. And then of course, Adobe has Photoshop Elements, which is a perfectly good piece of software and it's much less expensive. If you're going to think about taking uh, your own photographs, I highly suggest you take a photography class unless you have years of experience. We have many realtors who have years of experience as a photographer and they do a really nice job and uh, they don't have to, to take these classes. They, they know what they're doing. And that's totally fine. If you're in that boat, do it. That's great. If you're just kind of new to it, I would suggest taking the time to take a class. There's a lot available online at lynda.com, uh, even YouTube, although with YouTube, 
you run the risk of maybe missing some of the basics when you're searching around for topics that you want to learn. Um, but uh, Udemy offer, also offers a lot of classes. So consider taking a class on that. Um, and if you're wondering what equipment we recommend, visit realtourvision.com recommended camera equipment. That's found right under our support tab. Click that and you'll see a list of uh, some cameras and lenses and type of gear that we suggest. That is geared towards photography who are getting into the virtual tour business, but it's perfectly applicable to our realtors as well. Now, the one thing that we see here at RTV from folks who are using our software to build tours, uh, especially the do-it-yourself agents, is they like to use their cell phone uh, for taking photos. Um, it, modern cell phones are getting increasingly good at taking images, but the chances of them ever getting to the point where they can capture as good of an image as a DSLR or even a uh, real high quality mirrorless camera, it's very low. And part of the reason is the cell phone sensor, the part that the light hits that captures the image, is very, very tiny, uh, less than a postage stamp size, compared to a full frame which uh, DSLR, which is about the size of a 35 millimeter negative, if you've ever seen one of those. And uh, that bigger sensor size gives you better reception to low light or to lighting situations, better color, better detail, and it's just overall a better uh, image is gonna come out of a, a more a camera with a larger sensor. The other problem is that lenses are not typically wide enough on cell phones for real estate photography. Of course, there are connective, you can buy lenses and such to put on your mobile devices and to make it wide. But those lenses are very cheap um, and they don't produce the best quality. They're fun. They're, they're nice to play around with, but I would not recommend it for this. You can see these couple of examples here. This is from a marketing piece that we built showing the difference. And, and number one, you can see the image on the left taken with the cell phone. Of course, the lighting is not balanced. You can do that in post-processing, and we'll talk a little bit about that. Um, this could be improved in that, but you'll notice how less wide the image is, how there's almost as much focus on the bed and uh, the view rather than the space as a whole. And uh, that's very, very important. You definitely want to be focusing on the space. You're not there to sell furniture. You're there to sell the space. So you want to uh, make sure that you are shooting nice and wide. And cell phones uh, definitely have a little bit of an issue with uh, getting appropriately wide images. Now, if you must use your cell phone, there are certain things you can do to kind of help yourself and, and get better image quality. Um, first, get the Adobe Lightroom mobile app. It is completely free and it is very, very powerful. Um, I use this all the time. My daughter actually just won a, a photography contest using her cell phone and Lightroom mobile. Um, and it, so just, it's a really, really powerful tool. And uh, again, you're better off using a DSLR, but if you're going to, I suggest using Adobe Lightroom mobile app. You can edit your photos right on your phone uh, with that app, and it also allows you to shoot RAW or DNG files from your phone. Now, what that means is when you, so let me explain, when you take a picture with a cell phone just by itself, typically you get a JPEG out of that. Same thing with cameras. You have a setting where you can shoot in JPEG or you can shoot in RAW or DNG. Uh, the JPEG is, the camera is making decisions for you on what your contrast and your sharpness should be, what the colors is. And when it saves that images, all that extra images or all the extra data that was in that file is taken out because it compresses the file. That's the thing with JPEGs. They try to give a very small file size and it does that by reducing uh, data that's in the file that isn't necessary. Shooting in RAW or DNG keeps all of that data and gives you a lot more latitude. If you have a situation where the foreground is very dark, shooting in RAW will allow you to be able to pull up those shadows so it's balanced much more than a JPEG will. And the beautiful thing is then you save a JPEG off of it, you can always go back and re-edit that RAW or DNG file. It's, uh, the changes you make on those are what we call non-destructive, meaning that you can go back and change them. Whereas if you edit a JPEG and save it, you're compressing that file again. You can edit, but you're going to continually get a smaller and smaller file. Now, that being said, when you shoot RAW, the camera is not making those decisions on what you should have for contrast and sharpness and color balance and those sorts of things. So you will want to 
use the Adobe Lightroom app to go in and adjust those things. Specifically contrast, tend to always want to bump up that contrast a little bit to get some nice uh, difference between your darks and your lights. Uh, you want to adjust your white balance and your saturation. The beautiful thing is you can make a lot larger changes with a RAW or DNG file than you can with a JPEG. So here's some screenshots I took of uh, the app itself. And, and this is on the uh, uh, iPhone. I was looking at this on an Android phone yesterday. Very, very similar, not quite exact, but very close. So you'll see first on the screenshot to the left, this little camera icon in the lower right-hand corner. And that is where you would go to actually take photographs uh, inside the app. And that's what allows you to shoot in that DNG mode. You can add photos from outside by clicking on the icon next to that, but uh, for this purpose, uh, we're assuming that you're going to shoot using the app. Now, you're going to want to use the pro settings. Um, there's this where you see pro right here at the bottom. There's a drop down, and you can pick several things. Uh, you can pick automatic, where the camera makes those decisions for you. You can pick pro, which gives you the most latitude and ability to change your depth of, or not your depth of field, but the brightness, darkness, contrast, things like that. And then there's HDR, and I don't know how many of you have heard of HDR photography, but that's basically where you're taking multiple exposures, uh, some that are very, very bright, so you can get detail in the shadows, some that are dark, so you can get detail in the highlights, and blending them all together so you have the best of both worlds. HDR photography has a little bit of a bad rap because it's very easy to get unnatural looking images. And of course, in real estate, the whole goal is to make the images look as natural as possible. Then after you've taken your photographs here to the right, this is where you can actually edit the image. So we have these icons at the bottom where you can select different things and you just have sliders and you can look at the image and make changes to it and see that live right on your cell phone. Uh, lots of things that you can change. Very, very effective tool. So as, as a whole, just uh, for you to get tips for better images, there's really two, two parts of photography. One is the composition, and the other is the technical side. And, and getting photography is a very, very learnable endeavor. It does have a bit of a learning curve, but with ample time and uh, some practice, you can learn it. It's something that everybody can learn. Um, for composition, it does take more time. Some people have a natural eye. You've probably heard that person that has a great eye for photography. Uh, some people just are naturally uh, gifted that way, and, and they have a tendency to comp compose photographs uh, better than others. Um, and, but not everybody does. Some are more technical, and they don't have quite uh, the eye for that. So if you want to develop that eye, look at good images often. Spend some time doing some research. Look at uh, you know, well-composed living room shots, well-composed exteriors, and look at pros, other pros, look at their work and try to emulate that. That is the best way to learn composition. Now, when you're shooting in a real estate, you almost always want to shoot in a landscape orientation. That's horizontal, where your camera is, uh, the image is going to be wider than it's tall. Um, it just vertical shots do not represent real estate very well. There are times where it's useful um, and it can be used for artistic purposes, but for the most part, if you always shoot in landscape orientation, that's going to be just fine. You always want to shoot towards the corner of a room, and I have some examples here. You can see in this uh, shot to the left that was shot looking towards the corner of the room. And you can see how these lines kind of converge, and it really gives the image depth. Uh, and that's why we suggest that you shoot towards the corner of a room. Um, again, shooting straight on can work in some situations. It, it's a matter of preference. It's a matter of the situation. So if you have an amenity, uh, and I've seen this with kitchens a lot, if they have a, uh, an island and you're looking you know, towards the, uh, the countertop past the island, shooting straight on will often work. Where it doesn't work is say if you're in a bedroom and you're shooting straight on at the bed. Again, that makes it look like you're trying to sell the furniture rather than the space. And of course, we're trying to sell the space. Which brings me uh, to my next point focus on the space. That's really what you're there to sell. And it sounds uh, like a no brainer, but it's very easy to shoot quickly and, and get used to shooting things. And you realize you've got a really nice shot of their couch 
and not the, uh, the living room itself. Watch for yourself in reflections. <laughs> it is very difficult to uh, take a photograph and remove a person out of it. Um, it, it, it takes some practice and some skill to be able to do that. And even the best professional photographers will try to avoid getting themselves in a reflection just because they don't want to have to spend the time photoshopping the image to take themselves out of it. Turn on all the lights in the room. Even if it's broad daylight out, that makes your images much more uh, warm and welcoming uh, rather than having everything off. If you're shooting exteriors, especially if you're doing twilights, having all the images or all the lighting on in the house gives it a real nice homely glow feeling. It's really a fantastic uh, way to just take that photography up to the, the next level. And so that brings me to the next part. Pick the right time of day to shoot. This is specifically meant for exterior photography, but it also does apply to interior photography. If you're shooting at noon at, in the middle of summer, the, your contrast, your difference between your light and your shadows are going to be very, very large. And it just makes images look harsh and stark and not inviting. Shooting in the evening or in the uh, uh, morning when the shadows are kind of long, that's really a great way uh, to make your image is much more pleasing to the eye, and it also makes the impact of the lights being on in the house much more substantial. When you're shooting interiors, uh, it helps just because there's the, the lighting outside the room and inside the room are closer to being balanced than when it's very bright outside, and so that will help your images, uh, help you create good images easier if the lighting is balanced a little bit more. On the technical side, you want to set your camera at about four to five feet, uh, on your tripod. Uh, that's your average size. There are certain times where lower is okay. If you're shooting with virtual staging in mind, the virtual stagers suggest that you shoot between four foot six and five foot six. Um, but the optimal height for shooting for the stager is five foot. So if you have a, a empty home and you're planning on using a virtual stager to uh, make those images uh, the best they can be with that software, shoot at about five foot on, on your tripod. Make sure you take your time to level the camera. It's a really, it's very easy to miss, a minor detail, but it makes a huge difference. If the room's, if the camera's tilted left or right, um, you know, it kind of looks like the, the image is just crooked and maybe, you know, you had a couple drinks before you went out and took the images. Um, so that's not good. If you tilt up or down, if you tilt your lens up or down just a little bit, you get a lot of distortion. So say I'm looking at some vertical lines like a door, if I tilt the camera down a little bit or up a little bit, you'll notice that those lines no longer look vertical, but they're at an angle. And that's just because of how lenses are constructed and such. So try to shoot as level straight ahead as you can. And if you need to make adjustments, say you want more ceiling, less ceiling, try adjusting the camera up and down rather than tilting it. You will wanna shoot at uh, the aperture of F8 or F9, if at all possible. Uh, shooting apertures, say at 5.6, five, 5.4, five, those sorts of things, do not give you the proper depth of field for everything to be in clear focus in the image. If you shoot at f11, that's okay. F16, those, you know, you're going to have that really good depth of field, but those lights that you turn on are going to start to give you more of that starburst look. Shooting f8 or f9 right in that range is uh, kind of the sweet spot to minimize that starburst from the lights, but yet get the depth of field that you need. Now, I will say cameras with smaller sensors have less of a problem with this um, as they are not able to get a shallow depth of field as readily as cameras with larger sensors. So that is one thing that is a positive for uh, cameras um, with a smaller sensor size uh, or um, cell phones, those sorts of things. Shutter speed is secondary to depth of field. If you don't have a sharp in-focus image, you don't have an image at all. You might as well not just not use it. And that's why uh, I suggest use a tripod. There's often such low light inside of a room that you need to put your camera on a sturdy tripod in order for you to get the type of quality and the, the depth of field that you need. Now, if, I'm, if all that's Greek to you, again, don't worry about it. Take a class, watch some videos. It's really very learnable. And uh, I'm not gonna get into explaining all the details on aperture and those sorts of things, but uh, you can learn 
if you search for exposure triangle, that's a great way to learn the basics of photography, how light and shutter speed and aperture and ISO affect each other. You're also going to want to consider learning advanced photo editing techniques, such as image blending. To get the highest quality imagery, it generally takes several images blended together in the real estate industry to get a nice image. This is true even if they're using flash. You can, from time to time, get a single exposure that's fantastic and acceptable, but most of the time you're going to want to blend images to get the highest quality image. So that's another thing. Um, and you can search for HDR photography. That means high dynamic range. And again, that's just a type of photography where you take images of multiple exposures. Some are going to look very dark. Some are going to look very bright. And you blend those together uh, to create your final image. HDR photography definitely has a bit of a bad rap, like I mentioned before, because of the fact that it is, uh, can be done poorly and make the, the image look fake. But when done right, it's a really a fantastic tool. All right. So that's uh, kind of what I have for the photography side of things. If you have a minute, please visit realtourvision.com to learn more about our do-it-yourself virtual tour and virtual staging software. Uh, we also do, uh, Julie Carpenter here is joining me on the call. Uh, we, she does also offer full service staging. So if you're a busy real estate agent and uh, you don't have the time to stage your own rooms, that's okay. Give Julie a call. She can help you out with that. And this uh, page on our website will give you more information on uh, the stager, both the do-it-yourself and the full service uh, ways of doing staging. So thank you, everybody, for listening, and I will pass it on over to Julie. Well, thank you so much, Jay. A great photo is just the best foundation for staging to make it easier. Well, hello, hello everyone, and hopefully I can show you how easy and fun this RTV stager can be. Okay, I'm going to assume that you have an account so that I can get right into some of the um, things that might be hard for you. So when you get your account, if you click on the house icon up above, it will bring you to all your houses. And it's totally free to set up an account. And it's totally free to use the sample houses to see if you would be interested in staging or if you like to do that. So I'm going to click on a sample house. Julie, may I interject? And let's, yes. Thank you. And when you set up a virtual staging account, you actually are given enough credits to stage a room so you can try out the software um, and actually produce a final product. They give you enough credits to do one image. Yes, that's right. So there's plenty of leeway for you to really get a feel. It's just worth trying. Okay, so I clicked on the sample house 220. And if you swipe to the left, you can see what that room looked like before the furniture. And then you can see what it looked like after they put the furniture in. And go ahead and click Edit Scene. And that brings you right into the room. Okay, let's go ahead and talk about what all of these icons mean up to the higher left. The first icon you see, it says mirror asymmetrical. And what that helps with is if you have like a sectional, um, sometimes beds will have that setting on them. So I'm going to actually get back out. And click this house again. Okay, because I, I had another scene of this very same room with the sectional in it. So again, I'll click Edit Scene to get into the scene. And I'll say Asymmetrical.
And for this scene, this isn't really how I want, would want to have it, but if it started out like this, then I would want to left click on my mouse button to make it red and then go up to the asymmetrical button and click it so that I could have it fit the right way. Okay, the next button on the top, wait till I get back to the, okay, is select all. So if you wanna be able to select all your furniture in the room, you just click that button. And then your next button to the right says invert selection. So if you selected this couch, but really you wanted to actually select everything else, it would select everything else except that couch that you selected. So that's called invert selection. And we have a duplicate button, which will clone whatever you want. So I'm cloning this clock and I right click it to select it. And then I click on the clone button and it just clones that. Okay, I probably really don't want three clocks there. So the next button we have up here is a trash button. And when something's red, that means it's what's being selected. So you wanna be careful that if you didn't wanna get the couch and the clock, erase that you don't have them both selected. So I'm selecting the clock and I'm just gonna trash it. And that's how that works. Okay, the next button I really enjoy because for a long time I didn't understand like how could I get to that plant back there without you know, moving my couch because I have my couch just where I want it. So what you can do is you can select your couch and when something is selected, it also surrounds your furniture in blue over here to the right. So I'll select that couch and I'll say, I don't want it to be seen right now. But if you don't want your couch to move along with your plant, you need to make sure that it is, the blue is not around it anymore. So now I can go to this plant and I can move it without worrying about that couch being in the way. Okay, and the next icon up here is lock or unlock. And you can see a lot of these are locked. And what's nice about that is, I'm gonna lock these two things that I just did. In case you're, clicking away, you're not gonna move this plant accidentally and then have to re-put it where you had it before. So the lock button is really nice. To unlock it, you just left click on it again and you say unlock. So that's in gray means locked. And when it turns red, that means it is ready to be edited and it's unlocked. Okay, so the next thing we can look at is if you need something behind this furniture, you can use the, to the right, there's two arrows that point down and you can press those two arrows to get rid of that and toggle your furniture selections down. I couldn't get to that plant there be, before, so sometimes it's necessary to do that. Okay, to add furniture, I'm also gonna make this couch where we can see it again. But you can see how it shows exactly what you have on this couch. We have it locked and we have it where we can't see it. So we'll just do the, where we want to see it. There. Okay, so to add furniture, that's our last icon up here, and it's a 
plus button and I can go to all of these categories any room bath bedroom dining so that helps you pick you don't have to go through all the furniture it can kind of narrow it down to what you want and I'll just say I'm going to add a chair and so here's all the chairs that I can select from the another nice thing is to save time you can assign styles which is way over to the right and has a little kind of price tag on it thing so if you click that we can add this chair as being a modern chair um, for instance since this third chair would not be a modern chair, so we wouldn't want to put that in our category. But this is just something you can do. Okay, so the next time I want to get a chair from the living room and I know that I want it to be a modern chair, I can click up on the magnifying glass button and type in modern. And there you'll see that only the chair I put as modern will be there. Only the things that you add in. So that saves time if you know you're doing a modern design or a traditional design. Okay, and the other thing we have here is you might want to only add one item at a time into your design, which is what we were doing, just adding one chair. You might want to add from a collection and I don't have a collection set up here but you can make a collection and we'll talk about flares later on but you can add from a flare as well so that's pretty much the furniture selection Okay, to move furniture, we'll use this couch. I'm going to pull it out here so I can show you exactly what to do. You push your left button to, to click it, and there's really three controls that are the most important to remember, and one is the Alt key. If you press your left button on your mouse and press your Alt key, you will be able to turn your furniture around however you want it. That's how you rotate. And then to raise and lower, not all of the objects you can raise and lower, but like a clock. I'm going to have to unlock that clock or else it wouldn't move. To raise and lower, you use your shift, and that allows you to raise and lower. You just click with your mouse and then click the shift as well, and then you can raise and lower. To size an object, for instance, maybe this picture over here, I'll have to unlock it as well. You may think that's taking up too much wall. I kind of want it smaller. So you can go control and clicking your mouse. And you can make it smaller or you know as large as you want. You can if you run out of your screen, just come back down lower and then you can continue making it as large as you would like or as small as you would like. Okay. And so once you're done with that, you can decide um, that maybe you're ready to try your free 10 credits so that you can try your own photo. So we'll go back out to the menu. And what you would do is you would click New House. And you could fill in all your information that you want for that house. 
Okay, and so I did this on the test one and I saved it and I uploaded three photos. This was a photo I uploaded first and I can remove furniture, but I just wanted to see how well the RVT stager removed photos. So I asked them if they could remove photos, as you see here in the third selection up above, it's like 10 to 25 credits. He does it depending on the hardness. Like if you said, I just want to remove this one picture frame, you'd be probably 10 credits. Okay, so I'll show you what it looked like once they removed the furniture. It looked like this. So you can see how well they did. There's a reflection of the curtains and it's just perfectly ready to stage. So that's nice. Sometimes a photographer will give you a picture with furniture already in it. Okay. So there's also the option to create another scene. And you just click that here. And that's two credits to create another scene. I'm not going to create another scene right now. You can download your scene, download photo. And I have set flares on this already, so that's another thing you can do. And we can talk about flares because I think that's what is a little bit confusing. So I'm going to come into edit scene. And I use flares all the time because it saves, you don't have to download your photo and then have them upload it or download it from an email. It just saves a lot of time. Okay, I need to get to the screen that shows the flare. might have to go out to this one. Okay, so when you get out to all your houses that you've done, you can click on your house that you want to send the flare up to. And so I'm gonna click Republish Flare, and if you haven't published a flare yet, it will just say Create a Flare. But I'll say republish a flare. And you could select as many rooms or houses as you would like for flares. I'm going to select this room for a flare. So I just left clicked my mouse to check it. And I'm going to come up here to the right and say next. And you can type whatever you want in for your flare URL. But right now it says sample 222 stage with me. So I'm going to publish that. Now if I copy this link, I'll say done. Whoever I give that link to will be able to see that room. So I'm going to click in another tab and insert that URL. And you can see that I'm getting exactly that room and even all of its information. So this can be helpful to give to many people, but you just click up to the right for start. And it shows them actually how to move 
You just drag with your mouse, click it and drag it. And they show how to hold the Alt key while you're dragging to rotate. And hold the Control key while dragging to resize or scale. Hold the Shift and drag to, for the floating items to bring them up or down. So that's really nice. But they can see this room and, and decide if they like that or um, they actually can edit this like if they want. Like I want the couch over there. Um, then they could send me a flare back showing me that we changed the couch and they can flare it to Facebook, Twitter, Pinterest, or Google, or email it. So there's a lot of um, easy ways to share or into a cloud. So that's really great. The other thing I wanted to talk about is there's different kinds of flares. The flare that I just did there is what you would call a 3D interactive. If you look at the very bottom of your information, it's in the mode category. And that was 3D interactive, so they could change or edit whatever they wanted. A lot of times I think that people are pretty busy if they're having use stage, so they just really would rather just see the picture and just tell you what they like or not. But 3D static would be where they could see the picture and they really wouldn't move anything around. So we can try that so you can see what that looks like. You click done. And they'll do the same thing. This time it's not going to tell them how to move because they're not going to do any moving. And they'll just see exactly what you see there. And so that works good for that. The next idea is if they just wanted to see, well, what kind of furniture are you going to put in this? And you just, before you t wanted to take all the time to rearrange it, you just want to make sure they like the furniture you're picking. You can do 2D collaborative. And so I'll show you what that would look like. That's not going to. Let's see. I might not have copied that right. Let's try that again. Okay. Hmm. Yeah, that's staying with the 3D. I don't know why it's it might have had too many opened here. So we'll go back to the sample house and because I want to be able to show you how that looks. Okay, we'll republish a flare. And let's see. Next, we only want it to be the 2D. Okay, let's click paste and go. If it doesn't work, it could be because this is a sample and yeah, it might be locked into working this way. But when I've done 2D before, none of this furniture would be arranged and it's just like in a row so they can see what kind of furniture you're going to put in. But when you do your room, you'll be able to play around with that and see how that goes. Um, the next thing I wanted to do is look at the two icons down here. There's a gear to the le bottom left, a gear button that shows my account. And you can do all your profile, um, passwords, your preferences. Here's the big thing since if you're really new, 
to this, make sure you go to your account and click Preferences and say Help Everywhere. And that's going to give you tons of help, no matter where you are. In fact, we'll, we can go out here so we can just see what that would look like to get more help. see. I think it might have to be for a new photo. I'm not sure. I think it is for a new photo, but it would tell you right away which keys to use for dragging, and it's really helpful. Okay, so down, back down to the gear button down below. We have a reseller domains option, and that's if you don't want RTV Stager at all to be on your photos or you would like to advertise more your company you can make your own domain and this shows you how to do that and here is where you can buy credits under the payment category and here's all your options if you buy a thousand credits you're getting your photo down to six dollars and 99 cents to stage it so it leaves you quite a lot of room for profit to do it that way. The other way you can add a little more profit is by the reseller plans. Um, it's $6.99 when you pay as you go if you get the highest level. The white label level is $10 a month. And I figured out that if you do the monthly, you need to at least do 14 photos and then pass 14 photos um, all of your removing the watermarks are free. You're not going to have to pay anything else, so it will be $6.99. But it costs one credit, so it would be like $7.49 or something if you did pay as you go. Okay, and there's your card information next and your payment history and your credit ledger. All right, back down to the lower left. We'll click the question mark. And there's a place to give issues that you're having. And PROG is the um, designer of this program and he's really good at answering questions and very supportive. Okay, the next one I hit was help, and this will just help you with everything if you read through this. And it will show you what Jay already told us, how to take photos and things like that, and how to get started, frequently asked questions, how to contact us, and pricing. But that's all I'm going to do for today because I want to leave a lot of room for questions to be able to answer exactly what you might be questioning or struggling with. So thank you so much and hopefully that helped you a little bit. Um, Julie, and I don't know if this is really for Julie or Jay, but the, there was a question that says, why does the virtual stager software ask you for all the property information? I know you don't have to enter it, but is there a reason that you should? I believe that um, a realtor could put a link under his photo on his website. And that way, when someone clicks that link or the flare, it just 
lets people know exactly what that flare is, especially if you have a lot of properties. But I usually don't. I usually just um, say, like for instance, let me go to my houses. You can see I categorize them sometimes just the person that I'm working for. But this, for instance, says 135 Spring Street. And that way, um, if I have one, two, three, or four different projects I'm working on for somebody, they'll know that this is in the 135 Spring Street category. Makes sense. But, yeah, otherwise it's really not needed all of that information. Do we have any other questions, guys? All right, I'm not seeing any right now. Um, but if well, they, if they have any, I know, reach out. I know. Um, maybe once they dive into it and get to try it out. Yes, Absolutely. I sure hope you do try it out. And if you want, um, yeah, it's just totally free to sign up and, and try it once. So um, you see how simple it is. It's And it's really fun. I, I'm addicted to it. So. If they give it a try, I think they'll realize it's a lot easier than you think. Yeah, and they're always welcome to reach out to us at uh, just visit realtourvision.com and you'll see all of our contact information. If you have any questions, don't hesitate to reach out to us, please. Awesome. Yes, because I think um, Jason or Jay could relay a question to me as well if it's for the virtual staging and we could get all of those questions answered if they come up in the future. Awesome. Well, thank you so much for your time, Julie and Jay. We really appreciate it. Um, as we mentioned in the beginning, this was recorded and we will have it up on our website. Please feel free to share it with anyone else who might want to learn a little bit about photography and real staging. Excellent. Thank you very much for having us. We really appreciate it. Of course. Have a great day, everyone. You too. Yes, thank you. Bye-bye.